This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. I have John Rubino joining us this morning. John is a noted author. Uh, we feature his, work, his most recent book with uh, James Turk, The Money Bubble, on our site. And additionally, when he's got extra time, he's the publisher and editor of DollarCollapse.com and frequent visitor here, John. Welcome back. Hi, Gord. Good to see you again. How quickly the month goes, right? Yeah, it seems like we talked just a, a week or so ago. Of course, we did, because of, but on a different subject, huh? Yeah, yeah exactly. John, yeah. we... Uh, I need to make a point. Uh, I do so many interviews on financial repression uh, with guests. This is not uh, an interview. Uh, John and I have this monthly uh, discussion, so we'll interrupt each other as we go, and we usually pick a theme. Um, and, and a month in advance, John, we never know what it's going to be and, uh, and really focus in on it. And what we're going to talk about today is the, what we call the de-dollarization and the shifts that are beginning to that are the undercurrents of what's been going on for some time and I believe John some acceleration is happening and I got three points up here that I hope we can kind of dwell into but dwell into but we'll see how it goes and the first is this major development of the Asia in infrastructure investment bank I think it's truly significant your comments um, yeah, it's a big deal, more for what it represents in the short run than for, for the actual numbers involved. But um, the, the background to this is that the, the U.S., because it owns the world's reserve currency, dominates the, the big multinational um, financial institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And, and you know, we've been corrupted by the power that we've had for, for all these years. You know, unlimited printing press, the, everybody in the world wants dollars. That gives us the ability to to uh, run a global military empire and dominate these financial institutions. And, and we basically bully people in the rest of the world. And, and the rising powers in the world resent that. And so they're looking for ways to uh, um, limit our ability to use the dollar to push them around. And this is one of the things that uh, China is doing. It, it's set up um, uh, an Asian development bank that competes with the World Bank for financing infrastructure in Asia. And the U.S. Um, tried to stop this thing uh, from, from spreading, tried to stop it from becoming um, a, a, a big, powerful institution that could compete with the World Bank, and, uh, and it failed miserably. It, it uh, lobbied a lot of um, our allies to stay out of it, and everybody blew us off. Everybody said, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll join, you know, because everybody wants a piece of the Asian infrastructure pie. And so the rest of the world enthusiastically embraced this bank that China's forming, and the U.S. is left out in the cold here, which is a, a huge political and economic defeat for us. It was a, I, and, in, my uh, mind, in my mind, John, it was almost a mutiny because Obama was, first of all, threatening Australia, and they said, we're going anyway. And then he was threatening Cameron in the U.K., and you, you, Cameron said, no, we're joining. And once Cameron did, the rest of Europe just was right in behind it. Now we've got, I don't know, 57 new charter or charter members alone there's no countries in the world that are not joining it. i mean so it was a devastating blow to america's reputation and i think it was personally an anti-american movement because they're so frustrated um, yeah yeah and it was a, a real uh, it, it doesn't mean something immediate is going to happen but it was the fact that it was the world pushing back so strongly against america uh is the thing that concerns me the most here short term yeah, because that this is how um, a regime change in the yes. global economy happens. We, uh, uh, you, you know, the the old power tries to assert itself and and fails, and so all of a sudden, um, we're not the last word on this subject anymore. Um, the the global financial community had to choose between the U.S. and China, and they chose China, and so. You know, it's going to take a long time for this development bank to ramp up and and. Uh, even then, the numbers are, are not going to be gigantic early on, uh, but 
a lot of the loans that it's going to make will be in Chinese currency. So it's going to bypass the dollar. And as it grows, the amount of development funding, you know, the amount of um, high quality loans that are going to be circulating in the world uh, will be in Chinese yuan rather than the dollar. And so this is a trend change. And um, in big markets, it takes a long time for trends to really play out and to have major numerical impacts. But it's definitely a change in trend. And it's definitely something that we want to pay attention to. And as the numbers get bigger, it'll have more and more of a, a fundamental effect on the, the balance of power between the US and China, and in general, between the West and the developing world. Let's try uh, fifty-four trillion dollars on size uh, for numbers. Now, where does that number? Where does that number come from? That's that's what the, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has said is its goal, its target. What is required for the build-out of infrastructure in Asia? Remember, we have the ASEAN Common Market coming into place here next year, which is a discussion in itself. Uh, McKinsey, who done a global study, believes there's a requirement. Of the same number, they came out with 54 trillion. So I, I, I don't think they weren't not talking, but that's the number they have. And John, the research that we've been doing on the Financial Repression Authority, we did a fair bit of work with Credit uh, Re, and our Swiss Re rather, and they have a, a, a paper out, a fairly extensive one, um, and and in it they're talking about where they think investment should be in the future, and they're really got it nailed or nailed, focused on infrastructure. And to the point where they've got tools and in policies, insurance, protection, risk kinds of structures in place already that they're starting to promote, all based on, they believe, a global infrastructure play. I've got to believe that there's a lot of people talking about these kinds of subjects together. And what it means is that's a tremendous bleed of available capital in one direction. That's got to not only not dollars, if it's going to be denominated in, or some part of it in non-dollars, a bleed against dollars. And I think we have something like six to seven trillion of U.S. dollars floating around outside of the United outside of the States that won't be as required. But additional, just the capital available to finance the U.S. Treasury. Am, am I off track in that? Well, it, it you know it, it means a gradual regime change, and what that implies in the future, it's it's not good for the dollar. Although, if it results in a growing, stable world, that's that's still good for us, even if the, the dollar Correct. isn't the, uh, the centerpiece of the process. Um, I suspect there's a big financial crisis coming way before that happens, you know, so we have to get through the, um, the work off a of a lot of the bad debt that's been taken on in the last 30 years before we can start talking about a, a boom going forward. So, there are lots of moving parts to this story. And um, right now, the dollar is kind of the only game in town from a currency standpoint. The rest of the world is, is in a, a stressful position, whether it's Japan with its demographics or China with its possibly bursting credit bubble or Europe with the, the Europe or the Euro imploding. Um, it's all sending money to the US because we look like a safe haven based um, on a comparison with these other societies right now. And so as long as the dollar is, is strong because of these global capital inflows, then everybody can ignore news like the, uh, the new Chinese development bank or the other stuff that's going on over there. And, um, and, and so this becomes kind of a side story. But as soon as the trends reverse and the dollar starts to correct, which it's going to have to at some point in the not too distant future, because the strong dollar is causing corporate profits to go down in the U.S., which is liable to impact share prices, which will um, send the wealth effect into reverse, slow down the economy, terrify the Fed, and they'll, they'll have to devalue the dollar at some point in the next couple of years, I would think. So when that trend reverses and the dollar starts going back down and people start looking for reasons for that, then they'll pick up on, on the stuff we're talking about today and it's going to loom larger. So what we're discussing now is something that should be understood by people um, because it's going to be a big deal in the future. It's going to be one of the reasons cited on CNBC uh, for the dollar weakness and, and for uh, predictions of future dollar weakness. And, uh, and, and so it's a it's an important thing to understand now, but it probably won't affect the market until it becomes 
something that uh, is part of the weak dollar story. And that has to uh, that has to wait until the U.S. economy slows down appreciably and we join the currency war again. So that's probably a two, 2016 story, but it's going to be big when it happens. Exactly. 2016, 2017. The, the Chinese in no way want this to be rapid. Um, but right and right now there is no choice. Um, it's not in their best interest. But right now there is really no choice, strong choice to the U.S. dollar. But the yuan, and if it ever became gold back, or as, as this builds, will become a challenge, and that will begin to move. But you know, you've got you got Putin that we put in a corner, and he's got these massive, massive oil and gas deals that he's now cut with China, and moving that where the petrodollar will be be sold in non-U.S. dollars, where they're going to sell it or move, use either ruble or the yuan in that transaction, which could in itself, because there's been many agreements that have been struck between China and other countries to transact in non-U.S. dollars that's looming. And the you know, more we're pushing at, at and the problems in Russia, and a matter of fact, we have uh, Putin out talking about a Eurasia cur common currency, as he's trying to put a lot of the Soviet satellites into this currency kinds of discussion. The, the, these are not imminent, but they're troubling. Yeah, yeah. What, what's happening just in, in a general sense is that these rising powers uh, want some control over their spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. They want to expand their spheres of influence and they want to control them. And right now they, they don't because the dollar, uh, the U.S. via the dollar is in charge of pretty much everything. And so um, China wants to control infrastructure spending. It wants its currency to be a global currency that is used for both trade and as a reserve asset. Russia wants at least a safety buffer around its borders where it's in charge. And, you know, nobody's trying to set up NATO bases in the Ukraine or or um, bullying these other countries because the euro or the, the US dollar is, um, is so important to these countries that they have to go along. Um, and so it makes complete sense from that point of view. If Russia and China are going to be rising powers, they, they have to accumulate power somehow. And one way to do it is financially. And so, yeah, uh, Putin would love to have a regional currency that was dominated by the ruble. And that just bypasses the dollars, so he doesn't have to hold huge dollar balances and thus be dependent on us. Um, and he can sell his oil for for rubles, and then uh, his own currency becomes, uh, you know, a mini reserve currency in that currency block. And that increases Russia's power over the countries that use the ruble and hold it as a reserve currency. So yeah, it makes complete sense, and it's completely logical. You know, we're five percent of the world's population in the U.S., so there's no reason. In a, in a healthy world for us to completely dominate everything. It, it, that was a historical accident post-World War II. And so uh, a normalizing world in which we are one of a large number of successful societies would involve us giving up a lot of relative power. You know, We might become more healthy over time if things were run right, but we wouldn't be dominant. You know, we'd lose some dominance as these other countries recover from the, the trauma of the last century and, and start to develop and, and become more like us. You know, that, that's the ideal world, right? Where everybody else becomes rich. So we're, we're key players on a great team instead of the only good player on a crappy team. And, uh, and so that's what we should want, but we're, we're fighting it tooth and nail. <laughs> you know, we hate the idea of giving up power in relative terms, you know, and, and but we can't stop the process. And so that's what we're seeing now is uh, is us kind of flailing around trying to figure out how to stay the dominant power in every aspect of every part of the world when we're just 5% of the world's population and we're borrowing our defense budget, in effect, on the global markets. You know, we're going into debt in order to finance a global military empire and to maintain a global reserve currency. So that's unsustainable, but we don't seem to get it yet, but we, we will, you know, the markets will assert themselves at some point and, uh, and reality is gonna be inescapable. So it becomes a question of when that happens. You know, uh, history is replete with examples of exactly this, where mm -hmm. the country began consuming more than it produced and too much expenditure onto the military house and we can start with Rome we can go to what happened with with uh, with Britain etc so we've just seen these kinds of issues time and time again this this and not willing to give up power as the transition happens but some of the distortions John 
um, uh, after the post-World War, this whole petrodollar structure itself is being, as we said, being called into play now. You, for some of our listeners may not be familiar, you can only buy and sell gold, or rather oil, energy around the world in U.S. dollars. Well, countries that have nothing to do with the U.S. say, well, I want to transact it in another currency or whatever. That just doesn't happen. So we got now we have Russia doing that or debating that. But the bigger issue here is these, so all of the OPEC countries that are part of, been part of the petrodollar, have have sold it in, in U.S. dollars, but have then taken that money and put it into assets, primarily through Western banks. Now the fact with oil plummeting, their economies no longer have the money to fund their current expenses. So they're being forced to sell assets, the assets they have in U.S. dollars, to finance their internal uh, country as expenditures. That number looks, to, and it's only beginning, unless oil prices go back up, John could could approach a trillion dollars. The last cut I was seeing was four to six hundred billion, but it's getting closer to upwards of a trillion dollars. That That's a lot of money, a lot of yeah. liquidity being suddenly, suddenly yanked out of the system with, mm-hmm. with no yeah, other options. This, this, this is a potentially interesting um, angle to the whole falling oil price story. Uh, basically, most of the oil exporting they're not really economies in the sense that you and I would think of them, where, where there are lots of different sectors and there are entrepreneurs doing different things and and uh, and, and several different major industries at work. Well, mostly um, a country like Saudi Arabia, for instance, is just an oil exporter. That's basically all they do. And uh, and so they, they sell their oil to the rest of the world for dollars and they take those dollars and they invest them in U.S. Treasury bonds, mostly and infrastructure projects. And so they end up with a um, you know huge balance of dollars in treasury bonds, but no real economy that can function beyond oil exports. And so when oil goes down, their, their budget has been based, let's say, on hundred dollar oil. That's that's um, how they set their spending. Well, now their their income has been cut in half, and they don't have any other industries to pick up the slack. So they're stuck with this huge shortfall in foreign exchange earnings and a lot of dollar reserves. So they have no choice but to sell their treasury bonds to get the cash to finance themselves um, on an ongoing basis. And and so, yeah, like you said, the numbers are pretty big. The the, the latest annual number that's been published is about $200 billion a year from the major oil exporting companies. In other words, that's how many treasury bonds are going to be dumped on the open market, along with some euro denominated bonds. And that's you know, it's a big number, but it, it's dwarfed by the size of the quantitative easing programs that are out there. You know, um, Japan and, and Europe right now between them are doing something like $100 billion a month of bond purchasing. So the uh, in, in a weird way, what OPEC is doing right now actually helps the global financial system because the uh, the QE programs of the big central banks are creating a shortage of high grade debt. You know, we're we're issuing tons of bonds, but the central banks are soaking them all up and then some. And so it's not leaving a lot of investment investment grade debt for the other institutions out there who need investment grade debt to buy. So, so remembering they, they need that they need that investment grade debt as collateral to leverage up the vis a vis the banks because the lending yeah. is based on having these uh, tier one capital, that, which is in fact uh, treasuries or, or sovereign debt. So sure. John, it's not, to me, it, it's not just troubling that they're gonna have to sell that and not need it and impact on the dollar. To me, what's more troubling is they don't have the money to buy new debt. It's not like we're not increasing the debt in America, so who's gonna buy it? And right now, China's stopped buying, Russia's selling. They were China, they were the big, they're not doing it. The only buyer of any size is Japan, and they're just printing money <laughs> at a faster rate than America to buy the effectively buying buying the bonds. This can't go on too much longer, can it? Well, well it can go on indefinitely. <laughs> anyway, I shouldn't have I said was, that. I wouldn't have thought it would have gone this far. But yeah. but but it does say there's a it it doesn't add up. It just it doesn't make any sense. It says there's something structurally fundamentally wrong. How long it'll go on, who knows? But it doesn't. It can't continue like this. Yeah. Well. Well. In, in in any bubble, you reach a point where things are happening that should never have happened, and we're we're deeply into that territory right now. You know, the the governments of the world should never have been able to finance huge deficits by just buying up their own debt, 
and parking it in a different government department, which is what they're doing with their central banks. And so you now have a, a situation where, yeah, China owns a lot of U.S. government debt. Japan owns a lot of U.S. government debt. But the Fed owns more than both of them put together. And the it, it's, you know, it's stopped at this point. But at, at some point, as you said, if China can't buy any more of our debt and Japan can't buy any more of our debt and OPEC has to sell our debt, then either some other central bank, you know, the, the European Central Bank has to buy up all our debt or we have to start buying it up again. And uh, and so so we move even more deeply into what would have been considered crazy territory by most economists a decade ago. Uh, and so, yeah, how, how long this can go on? Who knows at this point if the Fed can have a, a balance sheet of three or four trillion dollars, which is to say they, they bought back that much U.S. debt. Uh, why can't it be 10 trillion? We don't know. See, there, there's a limit out there. There's there's a point at which um, things go crazy. You know, things get really dysfunctional. But we don't know what that point is because we've never tried this before. So it's you know, it's like we're we're marathon runners who decide to do an ultra marathon. Well, maybe we can run 50 miles, but we've never tried to do more than 26 miles, let's say. So, you know, there might be a limit out there somewhere that we hit, but that we, we don't know because we have no experience. And that's kind of where we are in, in terms of global finance. We're doing stuff that we've never tried before. So we'll hit a limit, hit the wall at some point. Um, we'll have a, um, a, a very disorganized unwinding of a lot of this debt, but we don't know whether it's next week or five years from now. And so all we can do as observers is just pay attention to this and look at the imbalances as they get bigger and bigger and be prepared for the, the wall when we hit it, because we, we don't know when it's going to be. But yeah, like, like you said, this can't go on forever. And we're seeing lots of things out there that kind of imply that we're hitting the wall. You know, the, the stuff that we talked about with uh, uh, the Asian countries bypassing the dollar and with OPEC having to dump dollar denominated bonds and with Japan um, with their demographic problems, throwing huge amounts of newly created yen at something that's really insoluble because it's demographic. You know, if your people are all retiring, you can borrow as much money as you want to. And that's not going to create more jobs if most of your people are retiring, you know, and the U.S. has a lot of similar problems where it doesn't really ma much matter how much money we throw at stuff. Um, we're not going to get back to, quote unquote, normal times of four or five percent organic growth a year without the need for government financing to keep it going. You know, we just can't get there because of all the money we borrowed in the past. So, you know, we have all these um, these dysfunctions in the global financial system. And right now we're throwing money at it. And. Are, are papering over the problems with all this new currency, but the problems aren't going away. And in most cases they're getting worse. And so at some point it blows up. So we will see it. But the stuff we're talking about today will be cited as the causes of the, uh, the crisis when it happens. And that that's going to be more of a, um, of a need for the financial media to put reasons on events. Uh, rather than, than these things being the actual reasons. You know, they're, they're the things that uh, cumulatively will have an effect out there somewhere. But the real underlying reason is that we borrowed too much money. You know, we screwed up and you can't screw up forever and it has to end. So at some point it's going to end and then we'll hang a lot of reasons on the ending. But the, the underlying reason is just going to be, you know, what we're seeing fundamentally out there, governments of the world, um, spending beyond their tax revenues, borrowing to make up the difference, printing a lot of new currency to cover their interest costs, and eventually getting to the point where they can't do that anymore and the system failing. Um, and that's coming. You know, it's uh, it's next year or the year after, but I don't think it's all that much longer than that. You know, we, we have to see a limit somewhere in the not too distant future. And then you and I are really going to have a lot to talk about. You know, these, this abnormality, these imbalances, this dysfunctionality, it, it's just amazing the level that it could go to. And, you know, and as you said, you know, we're consuming uh, more than we produce in an economy that's 70 percent consumption. That just goes without saying. So we have right now officially an 18 uh, trillion dollar debt and we've taken the Federal Reserve's balance sheet and we've over the last numbers of years we've taken it from just under about 800 billion up to four and a half four point three trillion dollars so that's a, that's treasuries 
that the Federal Reserve and our other had bought back and on the treasuries. So now that the Federal Reserve has got all these treasuries on their book, they in fact will get money from the uh, U.S. Treasury as payment on those um, on that debt. Then at the end of the year, they take the money they made, which is from the treasuries, they then return it to the treasury. And my friend and associate, uh, Richard Duncan, he, he's, he's arguing very, very strongly with a lot of charts. He says, what you have is debt liquidation going on here. Because as long as they never sell that and never put that those treasury bonds back out in the market, and they keep this little accounting back and forth going on, we have liquidated the debt. And in many ways, he's absolutely correct. The problem is, is all of that is collateral that's been taken out of the market that allows credit to increase. And it's without that credit growth, we have another set of problems. So the, the, the games that have went on and the dysfunctionality is going on, we're tr beginning, John, to trip over it in, in, in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. Because um, really what we are doing now, in effect, is direct debt monetization. You know, yes. we're, we're issuing debt and then we're buying it back with newly created currency. So we, you know, operationally, we could skip that whole in, intermediate step of buying back the debt, or issuing the debt and buying it back and just print the currency, hand it out to the world, because that's what we're doing in effect. There's people and, are talking about things like that. And, and handing it out in select ways directly to bypass the banking system as one mm -hmm. point. Well, there's even arguments going out at high levels right now that we want to remove ourselves from even currencies and making things taxable. The currency is taxable itself. That is mm -hmm. holding ca cash, that is, mm -hmm. the currency. Um, biz bizarre, because it's the only way to continue to grow and accelerate credit which is the lifeblood of a 70% consumption economy. See, see, Gord, what you just mentioned is a pretty good example of the, the next generation of crazy stuff that's going to yeah. happen. Because you've you got France right now talking about taxing currency. I think it's France. Yeah, that's what, exactly where it's coming from. Yeah. And, and you have city groups, chief economists, talking about outlawing cash, just doing away with the whole concept. And the, these are both ways of governments controlling people's behavior when the behavior isn't um, isn't furthering the government's aims. You know, holding cash is a bad thing from the, po the point of view of the government if they want you to borrow and spend. You know, you put cash under, cash under the mattress and that doesn't um, leverage up the economy. You know, that's a deleveraging act. If you pay off debt or you just hold cash, and, and that makes it harder and harder for them to get us to borrow and spend and, and pop the economy for another year, which is really their goal. They just got to get through the next year. They, they don't have any plans for beyond the, the next election cycle because they aren't operating with any kind of a coherent theory anymore. And so these forms of control are the next stage. You know, we'll see various kinds of capital controls where they, they don't let you move money out of the country. They track the movement of, we're already, of your um, We're already doing that with, with things called FATCA and mm -hmm. PFIC. And there's a lot of things that are going on that I'm, I'm actually tripping over in my whole financial repression series that we're doing. And it just had no visibility. But until you get outside and really start going around the world, you just go, oh, my goodness, the advanced stage that some of this. We, John, <laughs> we have capital controls. We just don't we, we, we actually we actually do. We have de facto capital controls right now because yes. it's incredibly hard for an American to open a foreign bank account, which is what a capital control is. It, it's, it's something that keeps you from moving money out of the country. And they, they've done it via regulation rather than than strict prohibition. And, and then if you have it outside, you've been out there and you're getting passive returns on it. They nail you with a 55 percent predatory tax on it. If, mm -hmm. And it used to be if you were outside of America and you, you didn't pay tax, you had no duplicate taxation, but if you made over $500,000, America says well, that's our money because America is one of the few countries in the world that says no matter where you are, your money's our money. But now they've taken it down to 200000 Now they're going down $100,000. I mean, uh, pardon? But, the, yeah. but it gets no public visibility. Unless you're See, outside the country and you're an expat, you're literally screaming. It, it's important to understand what a sign of weakness this is on the part of the U.S. too, because if, if you're a healthy, self-confident society, um, you want to invite capital in. You you know you want to say, look, 
invest anywhere you want to in the world. It's completely up to you. But look how great we are. You know, come on in. And uh, and that's the way we used to be. We used to be relatively free trade because we were confident enough to know we would benefit from that. But now we're, we're not that confident anymore. Now we're terrified that capital is going to leave. Yeah, we're circling, for greener we're pastures. Circling, circling the wagons, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're trying to trap the wealth that's within the U.S., within our borders right now, not let it leave. And that, that's a sign that we're afraid it's going to leave. And so, yeah, you know, th this is um, an early warning sign of extreme weakness in the future because these guys, the, the guys who are making laws like uh, FATCA, um, they see firsthand what the capital flows really are. They see what big money wants to do and it's scaring them. So they're putting laws into place now to keep the money from leaving because they suspect that the way we're going, it's going to pour out in a torrent at some point in the future. So they're trying to uh, to lock the barn door before the horse gets out. And an, I did an interview with Hayden Perryman, who's probably one of the world's leading authorities on FATCA in the United K in the UK. It's up on the financial repression site. And he says, the reasons that were given for this are false. This is not, it's not for these kind of reasons. It's not even about taxation per se, because there's easier ways of doing it. It's about tracking assets around the world. And a lot of these assets are assets that are, in fact, not traded on exchanges, uh, where, which are tracked. So they're the private equity, private, private placements um, if, that a lot of the exempt dealers, for example, handle. And so they want to know where they are. And the reason is because they don't, they don't want those assets to be able to move. And when they move, the collateral that goes with them moves. And, and mm -hmm. this, this is the kinds of things that they're, it's global, not just the United States, are putting feverishly in place. It means there's a very, and the rate at which they're doing it is stunning to him. He says, I, they, they don't usually, these icebergs don't usually move like this. This one's in a big hurry. So, <laughs> so there's, there's something of seriousness that's, that's driving this level of momentum to track the movements of assets so that they can be restricted and the, and the collateral mm -hmm. that goes behind them. And I stress that, the collateral that goes behind them, uh, because that's what all this debt is based on. And when collateral vol values start to fall, that's a real serious problem. And I just did a, a whole show here with Graham Summers, who lays it out in chapter and verse. It's up on our, on our site. John, we're up against our, our hard line. Clo you're going to say closing comments before we break? Yeah, okay. This, um, this talk, Gord, can, can be summarized as it almost looks like they're, <laughs> they're preparing for a currency crisis, right? Now they, they see it coming. They do. And they're taking steps behind the scenes to be ready when it happens. Um, and I think, um, at least from an analytical standpoint, they're right. Something is coming. And they're, they're making all the wrong decisions. They're, they're putting rules into place that are going to make things worse when the time comes. But they're, they're acting on very real fears. They're, they're, they're worried. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? We, it didn't go on for a long period of time. Don't start making financial decisions right now based on this. Because it's amazing how long it, it can go on. But And don't underestimate what as we've said, what they will or can and will do as things go on. But it, there's no question there's a heightened sense of fear and worry that's going on within the central banks. I, I don't think you conclude, can conclude anything else from their actions. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, as an individual, as you and I, uh, seeing that, uh, that, that kind of increases the, uh, the incentive to try to prepare for it by getting some money beyond the reach of these guys somehow. You know, it's getting harder and harder to do. But the fact that it's getting harder means it's more important to succeed. So I, I you know, that's a subject for another story, another show. But uh, I, I really do think that if you've got capital, you got to be looking at this and trying to figure out ways to get it beyond the reach of these guys when they finally do go for it, when they start confiscating um, domestic capital. Exactly. Not, not to avoid taxes. Or anything no. like that. Avoid confiscation. Yeah, to keep what's yours. <laughs> keep what's yours. Yeah. Pay pay the yeah. taxes. But but uh, that's that's what we're seeing. And I encourage our listeners to go to the Financial Repression Authority site because the, the the videos are there that show this is not just idle chatter from real authorities who are out there seeing it every every day, like yourself too, John. We got a break, John. Thank you very much for your time, as usual. I don't have no idea what we'll talk about next month, but I'm sure it'll be <laughs> exciting. So until then, see you later. Thanks, Gordon. See ya. Thank you. Bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com.
New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at gordontlong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at gordontlong.com.